Welcome one and all to the amazing pi prime link. Pi is an important number because it's the circumference of a circle divided by its diameter. The primes are those numbers that are only divisible by one and the number itself. And primes are important because they're the backbone of counting. Because every number, say the number 60, can only be expressed as the product of primes in one way. So here we have 60 equals 2 squared times 3 times 5 and you can't do it with any other primes. Now what I'm going to show you today was worked out by the famous Swiss mathematician Euler. And what Euler does in you'll see here is that he takes stuff that we all know in the finite world and he applies it to the infinite world. Now when he did it about 300 years ago, there was some concern that what he'd done wasn't correct, but now it's been proved by mathematicians to all be completely correct. So before I go on, a warning. Applying things you know about the finite to the infinite can lead to incorrect results, and you should only do this under expert mathematical supervision. So let's start off with this infinite series. 1 plus 2 uh, plus 1 on 2 squared, plus 1 on 3 squared, plus dot dot, you can see the 1 on 60 squared, and it just goes on forever. Now what I want to do is I'm going to show you a different way to express um, this series. In fact, I'm going to show you two ways. One's going to involve pi and one's going to involve the primes. So to do the, prime, the primes first, we start by taking this idea in the finite world. Say you're multiplying uh, two expressions, how do you do this? Well, in this case here, we take, we take every combination of something from the first bracket and something from the second bracket and multiply them and then we add them all up. So we're always taking one thing, exactly one thing from each bracket. Okay, so let's apply this to the infinite world. So what I'm going to claim here is that that expression, that series that we started with up the top, is equal to an a product of an infinite number of infinite series, which you can see here. And straight away I've put the primes in it. You can see here this first line is all involved with 2, the next one is all involved with 3, then 5, and you can see one there with 23. So uh, each one of these brackets contains uh, a particular prime. So how can I show you that these two expressions are equal? Well, let's have a look at this. Firstly what I'm going to show you is that everything that appears up at the top appears somehow down the bottom. So let's take that 1 on 60 squared. Now we know from what we saw before that there's only one way to construct the number 60 using the primes. And sure enough if we look here what, what I'm saying is we take from the first bracket 1 on 2 squared squared. We take from the second bracket 1 on 3 squared. We multiply those two then by 1 on 5 squared, and then from then on we just pick the 1 in each bracket there, thereafter. So for example in the bracket that contain, contains the primes 23 we're just taking the 1. So if we have here 1 on 2 squared squared times 1 on 3 squared times 1 on 5 squared times 1 times 1 times 1 and on for, for infinity, well then we get 1 on 60 squared. Let's look at it from the other point of view. If we take um, if we take some combination here, let me see, uh, let's take this one. We take 1's from each bracket apart from 1 on 23 squared, 1 on 3 squared squared, and 1 on, 20, uh, 1 on 2 squared. Well, then the only thing that we can have up the top is 1 on 144 squared. So what I think I've shown you is that up the top, anything from the top appears once below, and everything from below appears once up the top and so therefore we conclude that the two are equal. So I have shown you already that we can that there are primes uh, that can come from that uh, interesting series that we have up the top. We can uh, make this look a little bit neater. Um, let's go uh, look at this first um, bracket up here, the 1 plus 1 on 2 squared plus 1 on 2 squared squared and that goes on. That's a geometric progression uh, each term is just 1 on 2 squared times 
the previous term. So we can use the formula for a geometric progression here. It's 1 on 1 minus 1 on 2 squared, which is 2 squared on 2 squared minus 1. So we can go back to here. We can apply the same logic of the geometric progression to each of the brackets. And so we end up with this nice formula that our series equals the infinite product of all of these terms here, which involve the primes. So now all we need to do is show how this series that we started with can be linked up to pi in some way, and then we're done. Before I do that, let me tell you about my other videos. Uh, I'm in a mood to talk about my videos today because today I went over a million views for all the videos in my channel. Um, if you like this video, I've got other videos in a playlist called Favourite Mathematical Stories. I've also got another playlist, How Things Work, where I describe things like JPEG, Google Search, encryption, CT scans, using only basic high school maths. I have a playlist intro where I go through important mathematical theorems and understanding things like complex numbers. And I've also got a playlist called Made Easy, which is basically for late high school and early university students where I go through typical exam and test questions. So check out any of them if you're interested. So now let's return to showing that this series has some link to pi. So I want to start by talking about sine x. Now a lot of people use this trigonometric identity or function, but maybe you haven't ever asked the question, is there an equation for sine x? And it turns out that there is an equation, and in keeping with the infinite theme that we've got going through this video, it turns out to be an infinite series, and here it is. And this works for all values of x. It's, um, if you want to know more about it, have a look at my video, Taylor Series Made Easy. So, and I, I suppose I should point out this 3 uh, with the exclamation mark means 3 factorial, which is 3 by 2 by 1, and 5 factorial is 5 by 4 by 3 by 2 by 1. So I want to create a function fx, which will be sine x on x, and we just divide the formula for sine x by, by x, and so we get this formula here. Okay, now I want to go back to the finite world. So let's go back to the blackboard and ask this question. Imagine we have a, uh, an equa a function, gx. We know that it's a quadratic polynomial, and you're told that it's got roots of negative 1 and 2, and you're asked to describe what, what, is, this, what is this quadratic. Well, because it's got a root of minus 1, that means that there must be in this uh, x plus 1 as a factor, and also because of the 2, as a root, we'll put in an x minus 2, and we multiply them together. There's one extra little bit that we need to consider, in that we could put a number out the front here. We could put a 5, a 10, a minus 100, and it would still be quadratic. It would still have roots of negative 1 and 2. So now let's take that to the infinite world, and let's ask this question about fx. Can we write down a formula for fx, or another formula for fx, given the information about the roots? Well, sine 0 is 0, so that could be a root, but we're dividing by x. So sine x on x, when x equals 0, that's not really a root. Um, but then we have all the values where sine x equals 0. So these are pi, or plus and minus pi, plus and minus 2 pi, plus and minus 3 pi. So using what we learned in the finite world, we would say that the formula is something like this with the c out the front. And I've written it slightly differently, but you can see in this bracket here that if x equals pi, this bracket will equal 0. And so that shows the bit about x equals pi being a root of fx. So the first thing we can do is solve for c, the constant, down the bottom. So if we look up the top, the constant is 1. If we look down the bottom, if we multiply all this out, the only way we can get a constant is that we use the c, and then we take 1 from each bracket. So we get c times 1 times 1 times 1 on forever, which equals c. So the two must be the same. At the top we've got 1, down the bottom we've got c, and so c must equal 1. The next thing we can realise is if we look at the first two brackets, then that's uh, the difference of squares. So we can express it as 1 minus x on pi all squared. And then the next one will be 1 minus x on 2 pi all squared, etc. So we have this. Okay, now if we expanded out the, this, there'd be no 
term with the coefficient x, but now let's look at the coefficients of x squared. So up the top here, we, we would have the coefficient would be negative 1 on 3 factorial, which is negative 1 sixth. And what have we got down the bottom? Well, we can use the same trick that we used before. If we're going to multiply this out, this term here, we could take this term here, which has got a negative 1 on pi squared, multiply them by 1 by 1 by 1 for, forever. So we definitely have a negative 1 on pi squared. We could also go 1 and then negative 1 on 2 pi all squared, and then 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And we could do the same with negative 1 on 3 pi all squared. So we would end up with the coefficient of x being this. So now all we have to do is multiply by negative 1 to get rid of all the negatives, multiply both sides by pi squared, and we have pi squared on 6. And if you look at what we've got on the right hand side, it's exactly the infinite series that we've been using throughout the video. So let's go back to this slide here, and now we can fill in the stuff with the primes that shows this link to this infinite series using the primes and the expression pi squared on 6 which is equal to what we've got up the top. And so that infinite series is really just a conduit. We can now say that the pi side is equal to the prime side. And so we've got pi squared on 6 is equal to 2 squared on 2 minus uh, 2 squared minus 1 times 3 squared to, uh, divided by 3 squared minus 1 etc. So that's the amazing pi prime link. I hope you've enjoyed seeing it.